We're Topple Galloway. I'm Steve Topple. And I'm George Galloway. What a week it's been for Donald Trump again, George, hasn't it? It's um, unbelievable. He, he, he goes Isn't through, it every week? I know. There's, we, we could do a whole monologue each just on him. Um, so this week what's happened is Trump has done another one of his um, um, rather controversial tweets, hasn't he? he? He says, and I quote... All in capitals. All in capitals. So, yes, you'll have to, have to imagine the, the, the format of this. He went... And imagine yeah. it in green ink. Yes. Gr green ink. <laughs> right, he said, never ever threaten the US again or you will suffer the consequences the likes of which through throughout history have ever suffered before. We are no longer a country that will stand for your demented words of violence and death. Be cautious. <laughs> Now, who was Demented he? words of violence and death yeah, more or less know. sums it up. Yes? Now, who was he talking about? George? Iran? He was talking about Iran. Yes, this is another, another manoeuvre by Trump, isn't it? And the ongoing war of words with Iran over, over the Obama deal that's slowly disintegrating uh, and Trump's threatening of sanctions upon it Iran. Is, it Your is, hot uh, take, George. Well, it, it reminds when I met Saddam Hussein in his bunker in August of 2002, and he agreed to my request to allow the arms inspectors back in and asked me to go upstairs and announce that. Mm. I was quite quickly the next morning on Fox News mm. and uh, the Fox News presenter said to me, and I quote, what was it like sitting next to a madman who's threatening to invade our countries? And I pointed out that actually it was the other way around, mm. that it was the madmen were elsewhere and they were threatening to invade Iraq, not the other way around. Um, Trump threatened war with Iran. Iran answered, you would lose that war mm. if you did. And that was the result. Yeah. Green ink for younger uh, viewers. Uh, mad people used to write to you in green ink mm. to emphasize their anger. Yeah. This was a green ink, all capital letters, mm. tweet threatening nuclear war. That's the only meaning uh, of those words. Mm. You will suffer consequences few have suffered in history, yeah. means uh, with the exception of the hundreds of thousands incinerated in the United States nuclear weapons attack on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Nobody has suffered this, mm. but you may suffer it. Which is, of course, bonkers on many levels because um, when the wind blows, all the nuclear would blow to Saudi Arabia just Indeed, across the yes, water, right. which is, of course, the chief financier of Trump yeah. and his family business and the United States and the British economies. Indeed, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's another sort of piece of posturing via Trump. But for me, there's... It, for me, this is sort of a fairly clear explanation or clear explanations, if you like. Um, firstly, you have to look at Iran's oil exports. Now, they're up to about two million barrels a day currently after sanctions were lifted um, in the Obama administration. Um, about 1.3 million, I believe, barrels a day is going to China. Yeah. Now, of course, the implication, firstly, for Trump's now r ratcheting up of the rhetoric on Iran is it forms part of his trade war with China because China's coming under pressure now from the US administration to bow down and um, not or rather stop importing so much Iranian oil. Although the American flags he's ordered for his next presidential campaign were ordered from China <laughs> and his daughter uh, who has a clothing range gets most of it's her clothes wonderful, made isn't it? in China. <laughs> the, so the China irony. stole our lunch, <laughs> but, he, he likes to but say. But stop importing Iranian oil. Um, yeah. yeah, so for me that's one facet of it. Yeah. What's going to be interesting, which is the second facet of this story, if you like, is the fact that the UK and EU are currently refusing to support Trump's position on the Iran-US nuclear deal, aren't they? They're, they're standing their ground. Now, again, you have to look at Iranian oil exports. There's currently about 750,000 barrels a day mm -hmm. of Iranian oil mm -hmm. coming into Europe and the UK. You also have to look at the fact that two 
two of the top six biggest oil companies in the world, Royal Dutch Shell and British Petroleum, obviously are based in European countries. Mm. So of course there's going to be a, a, a reserved response from the UK and US. And it's very interesting because it's going to essentially leave Trump's position quite isolated. It's well, yes, uh, theoretically true. Uh, but France encouraged India to continue importing mm. Iranian oil whilst preparing for a bowing down to American threats of sanctions mm. if French companies continue to deal. Mm. But we'll discuss Iran, I'm sure, another day. So, yeah. But Trump is a madman, isn't he? Mad dog, Trump. Mad as a bunch of frogs. The front page of this week's Jewish Chronicle will live in infamy in newspaper history. Incendiary, Kafkaesque, grotesque. It features a demonic looking half face of Jeremy Corbyn made to look as satanic as possible with the headline in quotation marks, although I think improperly placed, an anti-Semite and a racist. This is a quote spoken in Parliament, but not necessarily parliamentary speech, therefore not necessarily covered by the law of parliamentary privilege, and thus potentially open to legal action. And I dare say Jeremy Corbyn's lawyers are looking into that right now. It stems from a statement made, or rather screamed, in the face of the Labour Party leader by Dame Margaret Hodge, or Dame Stemcor of Liechtenstein, as some of us know her, because that's where her family firm relocated. Not for tax purposes, you understand, they just really like Liechtenstein. Dame Margaret, who's been on Twitter from 2010 to today, and who did not until this year, 2018, ever mention the words Jew, Jewish, Semitism, anti-Semitism, and never once accused Jeremy Corbyn in all those years of anything like the accusation she screamed in his face behind the Speaker's chair in the House of Commons uh, last week. That she could do so on the basis of 40 years of knowledge of Jeremy Corbyn, close knowledge of Jeremy Corbyn, working together, fighting together for the same causes, and being his parliamentary neighbour, and he having defended her at the nadir of her political career when the current editor of the Jewish Chronicle was denouncing her as a disgrace and a dishonour to the whole political system, Corbyn defended her. Never once did it dawn on her that the man who was defending her, the man who was rubbing shoulders with her over 40 years, was an effing racist and an anti-Semite. For that is the full quotation uh, that she made in Parliament, Scream screamed into the face of Corbyn with journalists leaning over the balustrade, writing down every word in Pittman's shorthand. It doesn't get much worse than this, Steve. Uh, a Labour MP mm. screaming the F word in the face of her own leader, calling him these foul names without the remotest justification. And yet, she's the hero mm. for the BBC's Laura Kunzberg. She's speaking truth to power, even though Jeremy Corbyn's not in power and it isn't the truth, mm. according to The Guardian. This is a full-scale destabilization effort, isn't it? It's another anti-Corbyn coup. Yeah. For me, it's very straightforward. Four points straight off. Firstly, she did it knowing full well the media would be there and that it would be picked up on. Um, so it, it would dominate the front pages. It was an extremely obvious tactical move by her. Secondly, um, it's been all over social media um, and some of the newspapers have reported it that only a few months ago she came out and said that Jeremy Corbyn is not an anti-Semite. I do not believe he's an anti-Semite. 
So after, as you say, knowing him for at least four decades um, and saying that he wasn't a few months ago, she's changed her tune very quickly. I'm not sure what information she's uncovered that suddenly changed her mind, but it's, it's none that I'm aware of, you're aware of, or many other people who know what's going on quite closely in the Labour Party are aware of. Um, thirdly, I, I think that if it had been me who swore at and defamed my boss when I used to work for companies where I had direct bosses, um, if, if I'd have done that then, that would have been gross misconduct under employment law and would I would have been, have been dismissal. summarily dismissed. Yeah. Um, and yet she has the audacity to get her lawyers to send him a Very letter. Very expensive lawyers, Mishkon Dorea. Indeed, while most of us can't have legal aid anymore, I'd like to note as well. Um, how, I don't know how she dare um, do that, but then I do know how she dares because that is the attitude of these establishment MPs that they somehow think that normal procedures that to the rest of us would be invoked if we had the audacity to do something like that to our boss, um, they think it doesn't apply to them. They literally think they can do what they want, as we see time and time again. And fourthly, um, I'd quite like to know how the children who are now adults who were in Islington care homes that she denounced were lying about their child abuse and rape and torture. Um, I wonder how those children are now. Margaret Hodge is, quite frankly, a disgrace to Parliament and a disgrace to the profession of MPs. That's why I believe it's a coup, you see, mm. uh, because she cannot really believe that Jeremy Corbyn is mm. an effing anti-Semite mm. and racist. First of all, because she knows him well enough to know that that's completely untrue. Mm. And as you say, because very recently she explicitly stated the opposite. Yep. Uh, there is nothing that has come to light in the interim uh, that would or ought to have dissuaded her mm. from that view. And yet she stated it, and she stated it in a way that it was bound to become the dominant political narrative. Mm. I mean, even this morning when I was presenting my radio show on the BBC television uh, station, I saw it on my monitor, uh, uh, another senior member of the Labour Party, though I've never heard of her before, someone called Nia Griffiths, yeah. the Shadow Defence Secretary, has weighed in on Margaret Hodge's side. And all the usual suspects are out defending Margaret Hodge. Uh, Novichuka Amuna uh, being the first of them, so-called Novichuka because he's deadly and poison. Toxic. Uh, toxic. Um, and we'll see how lethal uh, in time. Mm. The, uh, all the usual suspects, Wes Streeting, John Mann, all the Labour Friends of Israel crowd have in a coordinated way piled in on Jeremy Corbyn. Now, Corbyn is a very nice man, too nice, in my opinion. He's quite a sensitive guy. And this statement is so the opposite of the truth, mm -hmm. this attack so baseless that I can only imagine it has wounded and hurt him uh, personally mm -hmm. uh, very considerably. And that's one of the reasons why they do it, because they know uh, that uh, Unlike me, for example, you could not break me as a man with no. these kind of attacks, and many have tried. But they are continuing to try with Corbyn precisely mm. because they think they might be able to break him mm. as a man. Uh, so that's why I believe it's a precursor to something else. Yeah. John Woodcock, another of the Labour Friends of Israel crowd, which he's still in, by the way, so clearly you don't have to be in Labour oh, well, to be in the Labour Friends of Israel. He's left Labour, but not the Labour Friends of Israel. Okay. Uh, he, it turns out, has been regularly talking with Theresa May's people uh, about a new political alignment, and he's now openly come out in favour of mm. a new political party of the centre, welding the Europhile Conservative MPs, the Europhile Labour MPs, and the Eurofanatic Liberal Democrat MPs, maybe even the SNP, uh, into uh, basically centrist government. Yeah. Because uh, if you add all these forces together, potentially they are uh, a governing majority. Uh, and they, he called it a, a government of national unity. Of course, it would be the exact opposite. It would be a government of national disunity. Mm -hmm. It would provoke disunity in this country like we've never seen uh, before. So I believe they have weaponized this subject. They've weaponized Margaret Hodges' attack uh, on Corbyn in a way 
to provide a casus belli, a cause of war, uh, which will lead to them crossing the floor. Yeah. The uh, only question that would remain is how well it would do. Well, exactly. I mean, just I'll touch on that in a second, but just to backtrack slightly. I, I mean, the thing with Margaret Hodge staggers me because I, I wouldn't mind if there was an ounce of truth in the fact that Jeremy Corbyn might be anti-Semitic and racist, but there isn't, and she's done such a disservice to firstly Corbyn, who's campaigned on racism like few MPs have for many, many years. But secondly, surely she's done a disservice, as a lot of Jewish members of the Labour Party are pointing out, to the problem of anti-Semitism as well. Good point. But it, it's just... Uh, if everyone's an anti-Semite and a racist, then nobody will end up being an anti-Semite and a racist. No, and it's just staggering that she 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 came out with this ridiculous comment. But as I say, it's par for the course with someone like her. Her track record precedes her. And like I say, I personally find her, especially what went on when she led Islington Council um, with the scandal in child rape um, and torture in the 80s. Her, I find her a terrible, mm. terrible MP. But with regards to the centrist party, I mean, it's just ridiculous. I think John Woodcock came out and said, it's because we want change in this country. Change! Change! We want change! Yes, because going back to the triangulation of Tony Blair is real change, isn't it? It's exactly. Gonna, it's just, I mean, the whole thing is absolutely nonsensical. And also for me, the, the fact it keeps rolling on and on, as we said, it would roll on and on, it always does. It's distracting from real issues, like, for example, um, the fact that child poverty came out yesterday as rocketing um, since 2010. Well, one of the issues that it's distracted from is perhaps one of the most important in the field of the people we're talking about, Israel officially became an apartheid <laughs> state at the very time Margaret Hodge had her outburst. Funny that. The latest instalment of the Novichok saga has gone from the sublime to the ridiculous this week. With, with There's a new brand on the marketplace, George, actually. Have you heard it? It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's Ode and Novichok, available in delightful, um, classy gift boxes, allegedly, um, that you can give to your loved ones, because this is what has come out, isn't it? Yes, but why don't they show us a picture of the purchase? They're telling us to look out for Novichok, that there may well be more out there, but they haven't shown us a picture mm. of the perfume bottle or the box in which it was stored. But it's a very peculiar story on many levels, mm. and one that there, I think the official narrative is struggling to explain. Uh, first of all, Mr. Rowley can't remember where he found this expensive-looking uh, perfume box. <coughs> he doesn't know when he gave it to his sadly now deceased uh, partner, Don Sturgis. Uh, he doesn't remember where he found it. He doesn't remember when he gave it to her. It may have been lying around in his house for a couple of days, he said, before he gave it to her. Thirdly, when she sprayed it on her wrist, she more or less immediately became ill. Mm. He, on the other hand, who got it on his hands, mm. did not immediately become ill. In fact, didn't even accompany her to the hospital, yeah. uh, to which she was removed by ambulance. An ambulance which turned up in hazmat suits, apparently. Mm. Uh, he didn't go with her to the hospital. He went to a hog roast. Uh, a garden party. As he went into is. town and uh, presumably was in contact with people in town, certainly in Boots the Chemist, where he received his daily uh, methadone mm. injection. He didn't become ill for many hours later, some six, seven hours later. And he, of course, has survived. Four out of the five people who've been visited by Mr. Novichok mm. have now survived, so a 20% success rate. But here's something that None of the media have picked up. The police took several days to find this perfume bottle in a small flat because it presumably had been hidden mm. and because they would have found it right away if it hadn't been hidden, but they didn't find it for some days. So you give your partner a perfume bottle, she rubs it on her wrist, even though it's odorless mm. and uh, oily, he says, uh, and she immediately falls ill and you hide the bottle that she's just rubbed on her wrist. And moreover, funny perfume bottle, at least to me, I'm not an expert in perfume, but apparently you have to fit a pump on the perfume bottle before you can spray it. 
Now, as I've been pointing out in my article on RT.com uh, this week, uh, this nixes the uh, prevailing narrative prior to that, which was that a gel had been smeared mm. on a doorknob. Moreover, that the KGB had taken 10 years to develop this program of assassination and to train people to put gel on a door handle. That's what Boris Johnson said. He had a copy of a manual. You couldn't just tell the KGB, this is how you smear it on a door. No, a manual. But it couldn't have been gel, could it? And therefore it couldn't have been on the door handle. And it couldn't have been in any case because as Don Sturgis mm. proved, it only takes 15 minutes to act, not four hours which is the time that elapsed between the doorknob being touched for the last time by the scripples mm. and them falling ill in the park. So it's getting curiouser and curiouser, isn't it? Oh, look, it's not curious. There's more holes in this than a piece of Dutch cheese. It's absolutely ridiculous. Swiss cheese, you Swiss, Swiss cheese, Dutch, Swiss. Um, but yeah, it, <laughs> it's just, I, I, I have nothing to add, really, apart from the fact it is absolutely preposterous. Um, it, it, it just gets more and more peculiar um, and why I, I, I have no why are we the, I, that's what's peculiar why are we the only people discussing this when ITV mm. interviewed him why didn't they make these points to him and who interviewed him yeah. we don't know no we don't um, I, did, I watched again the just like the previous press association interview mm. with Yulia Skripal uh, only one person interviewed him mm. and didn't ask him any difficult questions yeah. Uh, I, I've got loads of questions. Uh, did uh, Mr. Rowley and or his late partner ever meet the Scribbles? That's really quite an important That question. is quite important, yeah. And Absolutely. if this perfume bottle is the weapon, mm. well, the weapon was found in Mr. Rowley's house mm. after several days of searching. In most crimes, that would make Mr. Rowley a suspect. Now, I'm not saying he was he, he, he's guilty of anything. Mm. Of course not. Uh, I've got no evidence to suggest that at all. But in any other investigation, he'd certainly be a suspect. Yeah, he'd be arrested, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah, he'd be arrested. This weapon has been found in your house. You hid it mm. uh, from uh, the police uh, so that they couldn't immediately find it. Mm. Even though your partner, 15 minutes after using it, was in such a parlous state, she had to be taken away by ambulance and subsequently mm -hmm. died. I don't think this is the last time we'll be discussing uh, Novichok. Chok. But on the subject of Chok, you've got, I know it's a terrible segment, <laughs> but you have got a really interesting and rich yes. chocolate story. It's, it, it's, it's a remarkably full and vibrant tapestry, this one. Um, it, it, it's delicious to avoid a pun. Kit Kat, um, Kit Kat, everyone's favourite four-finger chocolate bar, um, has been denied a trademark, denied a trademark by those corporate cronies, the despicable EU. Um, it, it's not allowed to trademark, it's trapezoid was the word. It's four trapezoid chocolate bar. Um, um, and this has been an ongoing legal battle apparently for 11 years. So um, do perfidious European manufacturers wish to themselves produce trapezoid chocolate? I think they do, yes. I think that's the implication that obviously the EU does not like our Kit Kats in the same way it didn't like our bendy, our bendy cucumbers. Um, uh, yeah, and, and bent bananas. And, bent bananas. and, and, and uh, the rest of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems extremely churlish. I think it's an anti-British man. <laughs> is it to punish us? Well, well, I mean, it's Nestle, isn't it? Those yeah, are, um, so it's not even British. It's not a British company. Those of um, breast milk formula scandal um, and the company that operates out of Israel, but that's another story. Um, yes, I, I'm not sure. I think it's the EU. Now, how does this relate, if it does, to Toblerone going back to their original form? <gasps> Did you know that? That Toblerone which is a form, I don't, it's not trapezoid, but it's a very recognisable mm. form mm. of chocolate bar. They dispensed with what had made them famous. It's like Milwaukee scrapping the beer industry. It made them famous, they scrapped it, but now they're bringing it back. I didn't, never mind Novichok. What's going on with chocolate bars, What's George? happening in the chalk industry? Indeed. Watch this space. 
As we speak, I believe the polls are going to be closing on Wednesday in Pakistan's general election. It's been marred by violence and controversy um, as we're putting this out. We're not sure how many people have currently died, but there was a bombing and gun shooting in Pakistan. Um, this, however, George, um, is not an area of expertise for me, so I'm here today for an education in five minutes on Pakistani politics and what the hell is going on with their general election? Well, it is uh, an area of my expertise. Mm. In fact, I hold the two highest civil awards in Pakistan, the mm. Halali Pakistan and the Halali Qaidi Azam, for my work uh, in the 1980s on the restoration of democracy mm. in Pakistan and my work on Kashmir, which goes back many decades. And uh, by the time people see this, almost certainly, Imran Khan, the former Pakistan cricket mm. captain, will be the captain of the nation. Uh, almost certainly, he'll win the premiership. Mm -hmm. uh, he's very popular. He hasn't been, if you like, sullied or damaged by previous corruption because he's never been in power before, mm. whilst his rivals uh, have been all too much in power mm. and all too much sullied. Uh, by the stain of, uh, of corruption on a grand scale. The uh, main rival to Imran Khan is now in jail. Uh, he's Nawaz Sharif, the outgoing right. prime minister, and he's been arrested on return to Pakistan from London for crimes which emerged from the Panama Papers, which showed that he, his family, even his small children as they were at the time, the property was purchased, are the owners of vast pieces of expensive real estate here in London. Mm. It's a very British crime. Uh, <laughs> he's campaigning from his cell and is unlikely to prevail, mm. partly because he's not as popular now, given the emergence of these facts, as Imran is, uh, but partly because the military don't want him to uh, prevent I was, I was going to ask you about that, yeah, because I've seen a lot of chatter about um, the sort of military influence on the elections. Is there any truth in that? Has there been, has yes, been the, the, the military uh, may not be able to put you in power, but they can mm. certainly keep you out of power. Okay. And they can certainly remove you from power, as Benazir Bhutto, for example, was twice removed from power under military direction. Uh, but you can't fake the level of enthusiasm for Imran Khan that there is. Partly because of his own qualities, he's a charismatic figure, mm. uh, quite dashing, he was a national hero as a cricketer, uh, but also for the reasons I mentioned, that mm. he isn't the other two. Okay, so do you think, therefore, though, he will be the reformer that Pakistan needs? Well, possibly not. And if he were, perhaps the military wouldn't be uh, ready to support him. Mm. I personally think Pakistan needs more than reform, revolution. Mm. There needs to, okay. indeed, there long needed to have been a revolution in Pakistan. Imran is uh, alleged to be too sympathetic to the Islamist and jihadist trends, the kind of people who uh, blew up all those people in Quetta mm. to which you referred. You could argue that if he is, and I'm not saying he is, uh, then he might be able to keep them under control more than the current government has been. If I were a Pakistani, I'd have voted for Bilawal, uh, Benazir Bhutto's uh, son, who's the now leader of her party, the Pakistan People's Party. Yes. This is the left-wing party. Uh, I'd partly be doing it out of loyalty to her. I was a friend of hers, a very close one, uh, for uh, more than 30 years. Um, so I wouldn't have voted for Imran, mm. uh, but I'm sure he's going to be the Prime Minister. All the agencies are tipping that and all the betting is on that. Okay. Credit Suisse just a few days ago predicted with almost certainty that he would be the new Prime Minister. And obviously I wish him well. Pakistan certainly needs mm. everyone's good wishes. It's a very important, highly populous country in a very strategic part of the world. And if it continues to disintegrate in the way it has been, it's not only a disaster for mm. the Pakistanis, hundreds of millions of them, uh, but it's a disaster for the region and therefore the world.
No, of course, absolutely. I think then from what you've told me and my summing up from what I've learned today is that Imran Khan is a bit of a Tony Blair moment after years of rule by the Conservatives. Yes, he's going to hit the Prime Minister for six, right to the boundary. Whether the crowd will still be cheering after this, this innings is uh, closed is, of course, an open question. We've been toppled Galloway and alas, that's the end of the show. It is indeed, and we have indeed. But of course, as always, we want you to get involved with what we're doing every week. You can contact us on Twitter with your questions, suggestions, comments, um, notes about what we're wearing even, if you want. And Fields we, of gold, I like that. Yeah, I'm not going to comment on this. Beautiful, um, beautiful, uh, yes. beautiful song. Uh, what's that shrubbery in the background? Moving on, um, we also have a Facebook group now. You can go and join our Facebook group. Oh yes, I yes. must do that myself. You must, George, yes. It's what's the, our Facebook page? It's the Topple Galloway Show Facebook group. Come and join us for more fun there. And again, if you want to get in touch on Twitter, it's at Mr Topple and at George Galloway. Until next week, don't enjoy too much of your fields of gold. Just one more thing. I have known and admired Imran Khan for many, many years. I know him well, and I wish him well, as I assume he is, by now, the new Prime Minister of Pakistan. I only have a couple of words of advice for him, if you'll forgive me, Imran Saab. First of all, you should, as you have long argued, end Pakistan's dependency and over-close relationship with the United States of America which is thousands of miles away from you and cares nothing for you or your people. You should cleave Pakistan to the People's Republic of China, as should have been done right from the start. I hope you'll stick to your principles, and I hope you'll stop those who stick their fingers in other people's pockets. Just one more thing. On Tuesday the 24th of July, the UK hosted the Global Disability Summit, which was a collective of 700 governments, organisations and disabled people's representatives talking about discussing how globally we can advance the rights of disabled people. I had a major problem with this shit because the UK government is one of the worst human rights violators of disabled people on the planet. In two years, there were five reports issued by both the UN and the Council for Europe into the UK government, one of them accusing us of grave and systematic violations of disabled people's human rights, creating a human catastrophe for them in this country. Disabled people were dying at the rate of 80 people a month due to Department of Work and Pensions reforms, and yet suddenly our government is their saviour, hosting the world in the moving forward of disabled people's rights. The hypocrisy is staggering, and it needs to be called out at every opportunity possible.